And if you are abroad, that doesn't mean that you will solve all your problems. Not at all. Not at all. And that's something that I had to work on that too, because six years ago, I thought that coming to the United States will solve all my problems. I will see people who look like me doing great things. I will be independent. I will do this. I will do that. Yes, there are the realities that I had envisioned in Italy, here. Yes, those are realities, but you have to work for that and you have to maintain that. Welcome to Flourish in the Foreign, an award-winning podcast that celebrates, elevates, and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving abroad while exploring living abroad as a pathway to wellness. I'm your host, Christine Job, a Black American woman with Trinidadian roots, podcaster, business strategist, and entrepreneur based in Valencia, Spain. Hey everyone, welcome back to Flourish in the Foreign. I am so happy that you are joining me today for this new episode. For those of you that have already joined the Flourish in the Foreign newsletter, you know that I have brought back my one-on-one move abroad with intention consultations for a short time. Those of you on the email list got an email hmm, maybe two weeks ago about me opening up my books again to do those one-on-ones. I haven't done them in about a year and a half, two years. So if you have some specific questions about your move abroad journey, if you want to chat with me, this is the time to do so. I'm only doing these for the month of March. So get in where you fit in. I just wanted to do it as a celebration of season four and for the fact that I haven't done it in such a long time and I have the time currently to do it. So If you are interested in getting one-on-one consultation about your move abroad journey, go ahead and hit me up. If you feel like, whoa, I have too many questions, it can't possibly fit in one hour, well, then I recommend that you join the self-study version of Move Abroad with Intention course, where you'll be taken step-by-step through every aspect that you need to consider and organize and align so that you can not only move abroad, but to thrive abroad. It's a five-week self-study course, but you can go as fast or as slowly as you'd like. And it covers everything from really understanding how to set an intention to move abroad, to finding employment abroad, money management, moving, actually making that move, settling in and building community, and how to organize yourself for a long-term stay, or how to repatriate successfully. You can find the link to the course and the one-on-one consultations in the link of the description of this episode and also on the website. But it's best if you're signed up for the newsletter because you will get all the information first. Yes, and not late. So go ahead and do that. Flourish in the Foreign is a labor of love, but labor... Nonetheless, that's why I ask you to please support this podcast. You can support by going to buymeacoffee.com slash flourish foreign and buy me a coffee. You can support Flourish in the Foreign by making sure that you are subscribed to this show on your podcast player, wherever you listen. And then make sure you're following us across all social media platforms. So that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, at Flourish Foreign. Another way to support the podcast is by writing a review for the podcast. And I do read every single review and I love every single review that I've gotten. So thank you so much for those of you that have already written a review and rated the podcast five stars. If you have not done so, how about you go ahead and do that today? And of course, continue sharing the podcast with your friends your family, on your own email list, if you have a podcast, on your blog, blog, or what have you. Thank you all so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. Now on to the episode. (music) 
Season 4, Episode 3. Today's episode features Giulia Baldini, who is an Italian-Brazilian journalist based in New York City. During her college years at Hofstra University, she came across both the fashion industry and the world of journalism. Currently, she's completing a master's degree in Africana and African American Studies at Lehman College. While keeping the legacy of her first book, titled Fashion on the Beat, The Melodies and Rhythms in Fashion Journalism, through her brand's magazine dedicated to emergent creatives and young journalists interested in covering fashion of the same name, Fashion on the Beat by The Curly Flower. I am so excited for you all to hear Julia's episode. As you all know, Flourish in the Foreign is about showcasing the voices and stories of all Black women across the diaspora who decide to leave their home country. And we really examine the reasons why and how they are finding wellness in that situation and in that decision. So I'm really excited to bring you Julia's story. I know you will find her story as fascinating as I do, but I will let Julia tell you all about it. My name is Julia Ballini, and I am an Italian-Brazilian woman, fashion journalist and culture writer. I am based in Jersey City, New Jersey, and I've been in the United States uh, since 2016. I was born and raised in Florence, Tuscany, and that's in Italy. You maybe can hear from my accent. And I was born in a household pretty diverse. My dad is a white Italian from the south of Tuscany, from a region called Maremma. And my mom is a black Brazilian woman, so African descent. And uh, she's from uh, Rio de Janeiro. So as the locals would say, she is a carioca, born and raised. So I was born in the late uh, 90s in Florence. Florence is, some people might say that it's a pretty diverse uh, town since it's one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, in Tuscany. It's the capital of Tuscany. However, it's not at the same level of some cities that are in Europe, such as Berlin, Milan, or even Rome. So sometimes I make the comparison of Florence being literally in the middle of Italy, like the Midwest. I know it's a stretch of a comparison, <laughs> but sometimes I like to compare Florence with being like literally in the middle of, uh, of Italy in terms of also history, in terms of people and culture, given this environment, my childhood has been, I would say, I'm pretty lucky to have had the childhood that I had. Both my mom and dad made sure that I had a an education that was not only reflective of the place that I was born in, but also reflective of who they are and who they were, of course, uh, when they were younger. My mom made sure that I knew Portuguese since I was in her belly. So I grew up uh, speaking Italian and Portuguese. English came later in my life. Being a, like a bilingual kid was not a reality. Maybe now in Italy it's a reality. More and more kids are being born being bilingual, being from different countries. But at the time when I was born, it was pretty much peculiar. So my mom, she was worried actually for me when I was little because I started speaking fluently Italian and Portuguese only when I was, I think, three years old. So pretty much late compared to the other kids. But she was confident and she wanted to install me this part of, of course, her culture. When I was in Italy, I was always the nerdy and very calm child. My biggest issue when I was in Italy that I was observing with my mom and especially with my mom more than my dad, but I was experiencing like people that were treating her differently compared to my dad because of the education titles, because of, let's be honest, skin color and heritages. Like my mom is a Planted polyglot, uh, speaking uh, English, German, Italian, without even an accent, and Portuguese on, on top of that, of course. But no matter what, she never had like that kind of 
attention or like opportunities compared to my father, if that makes sense. That's something that didn't discourage her to be an amazing educator to me, to raise me and to be the person that I am today. And like emphasizing the fact that I am a woman, I'm a black woman, you know, uh, is important. I am aware of one big privilege that I have is the fact that I'm an Italian citizen. There are many black Italians who were born and raised in Italy and they still don't have citizenship. My mom, since I was born, she made sure that I had all my documents already prepped and done. Being born in Italy as a black person or as a, a person who has dual citizenship, it can be a lot tricky. And if you don't have the support of a family, but also the knowledge that the bureaucracy takes time and all that, if you're not apt to be skilled and just do the things, like you can miss the train and things just pass away, especially with Italian bureaucracy. My mom, she was telling me her stories of coming from Brazil to Germany, Germany in the late 80s. So... Her stories at the time didn't make sense to me, but once I came here, so I was in her shoes as an immigrant, but in another country, I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense now. Now understanding like also the emotions and the kind of burdens that you have, like I understand that now. Because of my childhood, because of my parents raised me, I think that this is the reason why I am here in the United States. I have no family here, so I'm on my own. But that's the spirit, I would say, more of my mom rather than my dad. Being a black woman abroad, embracing herself, finding herself in a new environment. So my journey abroad started because of university. I was interested to learn more about Julia's story of how she decided to go to university in the United States. So just for a background, for those who don't know, The Italian school system is basically on three major cycles. So there is kindergarten for little kids, and then we have elementary school, middle school, and then the big chunk would be high school. Usually when you are in Italy, you have to choose what kind of high school you have to enroll. It's not like the American system or many other systems that High school is just one standardized institution and they have only one kind of curriculum. In Italy, is there are different kinds of, we call it addresses, indirizzi. So different kind of curriculums and schools that are focused on science, humanistics, arts, languages, culinary school, etc. I chose the path of humanistic studies. So when you study humanistics in Italy, it's called the Liceo Classico. And a big chunk of the focus is on humanistic subjects, art, but especially Italian literature, a little bit of English, especially British literature, at least in my case, in my school, that was the way it was set up. And then we have the big difference, I would say, among others, is that we learn Latin and ancient Greek. We learn how to do translations from one language to another. We learn ancient theater, all kinds of works, uh, literature works from ancient Greek and ancient Rome. That was my background when I was in school in Italy. My dad is a scientist, a researcher, but also a professor. And in 2007, he got the chance to visit the United States for the first time in his life and to visit a few institutions such as the Smithsonian or the Bronx Botanical Garden. So everything on the East Coast. And there is a reason why I am based and I started everything in the East Coast of the United States because we had more connections there with family, friends, colleagues of his, etc. So he started having connections there. And for the first time, he was amazed by the diversity and people who literally look like me and our family as well, not just me, Julia, but also as a structural family, multi-diverse and cultural, eager also to learn and be immersed in other cultures which is something that doesn't happen too often in Italy. So my dad took inspiration, I would say, from the school system, and especially higher education in America. And I remember that he started saving up 
more and more money along with my mom. I was only 10 years old, but they illustrated me that there was going to be a time where I would have needed to choose whether to study or not study. I was not instructed, oh, you have to do university. I was free even to not do it. But they wanted to give me the option to study abroad and to be immersed in other realities. So they really believed in that. And so fast forward to high school, I had already made my big choice, which was to study humanistics. I knew that in my life I didn't want to do science, just the opposite of my dad. And I wanted to lean towards more screenwriting and just writing in general. So I decided to take the leap and okay, we're gonna go abroad. I didn't know until my last year of high school in Italy, whether it was gonna be England or the United States. And at the time also, I was doing two tests. So the SATs, of course, for the American college, and also the Maturita, which is basically a big exam, both oral and written, that high schoolers in Italy must deliver at the end of their five years of high school. So there's also this difference between high schools in America and the United States is that we have in Italy five years, whereas in the United States it's four years. And then we chose the United States because of the programs and the other options that some of the schools that had accepted me were offering. And that's how I came to the United States. In August 2016, I visited for the first time. It was the first time visiting and enrolling all in the same day at Hofstra University and in Long Island. So it was my first time understanding suburban America, understanding how to live also as a 19, early 20 years old in, in the United States uh, and not precisely in a town, in a city, because that's how I grew up. Uh, I grew up downtown Florence. So being in suburban America was pretty hard on me. At Hofstra, I studied journalism. I majored in journalism with a double minor in creative writing and civic engagement. My first year at Hofstra, I remember it as very happy. <laughs> I didn't have any cultural shocks or there were more like cultural observations that I was making and just gathering in my head. But everything was pretty, pretty smooth even too smooth. And um, actually all the problems started being more and more evident during my sophomore year and the third year, so junior. And those problems were more so obstacles when it comes to understanding my identity, who am I, what I want to do, understanding my calling, and understand it also that this journey that I have embarked as not only a student, but also as an expat abroad, I must be comfortable with the unknown, which is something that it was a privilege being comfortable in my own bubble in Italy. I asked Julia to discuss what her experience has been as a Black woman abroad, specifically a Black, Brazilian, Italian woman in the United States. So when it comes to being Black and recognizing myself, uh, the United States actually helped me in a twisted way because it was through understanding and having talks, genuine talks, honest talks with uh, my peers, uh, American peers, Black, Brown, Latinos, uh, Asian also, friends uh, here, I would understand more and more what it is like for people like us and how are we seen in society? Those things were already explored in Italy, when I was in Italy. But another layer was added when I came in the United States, which is, is that I'm an immigrant here. So that layer played a big role, it still plays a big role in who I am. And allowed me to understand and be more also observant of the surroundings and how people relate to me, understanding also my privileges that I had as an immigrant. Sometimes international students, they have more, I would say, obstacles rather than privileges, but nevertheless, there are some privileges that 
you understand them only later or you understand them only in certain conversations and contexts. And so it was definitely a slow journey for me. During those four years at Hofstra, it's like I lived eight years, <laughs> just the double of time. And I am sure that I would have learned all these things in Italy, but coming here and literally starting from scratch, it was, it definitely made my journey a little bit faster. During my first year, I didn't have any, I didn't have any problems, I would say, because I was so intrigued and for me it was almost paradise <laughs> coming to the United States because finally I could see people that looked like me, thought like me, and when I was in Italy or in Europe, I was always the black sheep of the group or I was too innovative. I was too much or never enough, X, Y, and Z. So allowing me to be here definitely is the biggest gift that my parents were able to give me. But because of my friends, American friends, who 90% of them are minorities, come from minorities and immigrant families, it is because of them that I found the resilience in my own actions and also in, in my own peculiar path. So yeah, it's because of the diversity of the United States and the people that I met here and are still in my circle that I'm the person that I am today also. Because when I was in Italy, I didn't have necessarily conversations about race or being a woman. I never dated in Italy. So the concept of even, oh, dad, I have a boyfriend. Like it never came up. It only came up when I was here in the United States and my current partner, I, he came to Italy. And th that's also another story, like how an American is dating an European, a black European. That's also like another, maybe another episode of a podcast. But my presence here in the United States and my experience and also enrolling in certain kind of discussions and understanding my identity definitely shaped the way that my dad is also thinking and engaging in certain conversations. He understands now more than ever that his daughter is black. His daughter is seen in a certain way and she's not a kid anymore. She's not just Italian and Italian slash Brazilian in Italy, but she's a woman of the world. And no matter the things that she will do or the people that she will engage with, there are certain things that she will be seen as, targeted as, labeled as, that it is up to her to deal with and maneuver this kind of dynamics. So once I published my book, he started reading more and more the adventures that I had done and lived, experienced in the US. And he, most of the times he didn't know what I was even doing like here. But he understood more and more how things like fashion, things like art, and things like race diversity actually impacted me, the person that I am. So I had to ask Julia, what was her experience dating abroad in the U.S.? So when I was in Italy, I never dated in Italy. My first experience dating was only in the United States. I never had any interest even in dating. And if I had, when I was in Italy, I was always disregarded or in a group of friends and other girls, I was either sexualized or seen as more for my Brazilian heritage rather than anything else. Or since coming to the United States, I had this apparently exotic look or whatever. So a lot of other people started being more and more interested in me in Italy. So when it comes to dating and also engaging in conversations in the United States, whenever I, sp I start speaking, every time that I enter in a room, even till this day, it's been six years that I'm here, people don't even notice how I look, what do I do, what do I bring in the room or on the table. It's literally my accent. It comes first thing and it sounds apparently amazing or apparently this greatest thing they ever heard, like a soundtrack. <laughs> and I'm still 
amazed by that because there are so many accents and there are so many ways that a person talks that I don't know I don't think anything is that special about me but that's something that actually the reason why I in school in ha- at Hofstra I didn't want to do any courses in broadcast journalism or even radio it was because of my accent and I was too afraid that I was either not going to be properly heard or encouraged to do more and do more of my work as a journalist or that I would be you know just considered cute oh that's the international student that's the international talent that because of only the way that she sounds like we want to put her on a pedestal and both of these considerations didn't sound good to me at all that's definitely something that also came up when it comes to dating and even like in platonic relationships i remember that being an european black woman especially italian because i noticed that whenever i was around international students and you might find also people that are mixed with other uh, heritages and cultures Italians already per se have some kind of stereotype here in the United States and if we add that with another unusual combination which most of the time it's either a black heritage or a non-white generally black or brown or asian so that of course comes even more and pops out more and sounds more intriguing and that's something that at first during my first year in the United States so in 2016 2017 it was more of a oh people notice me when i talk and i got it as a okay that people are welcoming me here they are interested in what i have to say but the more and more i would go forward i would notice that there was also some kind of differences in how i would be treated compared to other people and other international students that's something that i always found that it was heartbreaking and uh, something that never sat right with me and when it comes to dating so romantic relationships in the united states especially black and brown men would have been more interested in me and also geographically speaking within the united states in the south of the united states So for example in Atlanta I went there and uh, there most of the guys that were interested more in my Brazilian part and they would totally disregard the Italian part or who I am where I grew up but oh I'm Brazilian okay that works <laughs> it's accepted or if I am in the east coast some people would be more attracted to my Italian side and other people more the brazilian side and the kind of fetishize at the end of the day one of the two so that's that's a challenge because it, you never know what people are looking at you with what kind of eye and what kind of like intentions right now i am in a stable long term relationship with a guy from the midwest <laughs> I never thought that I would ever end up with an American to be honest but the reason why I'm also with him is because he sees me on a holistic level and appreciates the person that I am which is something that I haven't been at least in my experience not very lucky here in the US somebody that sees me holistically for the person that I am the way that my partner and I met was very a typical slash typical but i would say like typical in this digital era so it was on a dating app and it actually it's pretty funny because it was on this app dedicated only on black people and it was during the pandemic so 2020 and i never had much success with online dating and honestly i was not even looking for a boyfriend at the time i was on my big boss girl like era still i am i was like no man in my life i don't want nobody oh no 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 i will focus on books and the checks and this and that so that was my energy but i had downloaded this app because i was intrigued and after a couple of days i actually deleted it because i was not 
I'm not a big fan of online dating, but keeping, I just kept swiping, found this man, he was cute, and I was like, okay, I start talking. And after a few days, I deleted the app like after four days, I think, something like that. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna delete this app. I don't know if you are a bot, a real person. The conversation is going really well, but if you're ever interested in continuing this conversation, we can move on Twitter. So yeah, we met formally, I would say met on Twitter and the conversation started going. And one thing that I noticed that was pretty different that attracted even more for me, it was the fact that as a black American, he had already traveled and worked abroad actually. So he had actually not studied, but taught abroad in Honduras. And I was intrigued by that. That was the first thing because I was like, okay, like it's pretty hard finding a, an American person, especially an American man who is willing to speak another language, but who already, who already speaks another language and, you know, is just American. So doesn't have any family that is from abroad or doesn't come from an immigrant background. And again, he's from Cleveland, Ohio, and black American doesn't have any immigrant background. So I was impressed by that. And that's how it started. Just as friends. No intentions of dating or anything. Dating him as a romantic partner came later. And now we have been together two years, uh, almost and a half. And he's not my first American person that I'm dating. Not the first black American, actually. But one thing that I have been noticing is that whenever I would enter in places or in conversations with American men, whether they were black or white or any other race, they were more intrigued more about my upbringing rather than seeing forward, having seen a future, because also there is this stereotype if you're an international student or an expat, uh, you know, you're just here for an amount of time. So why even engage in certain kind of conversations that they can be even deep or like explore this person? Even if you have intentions of just dating for just a short amount of time, which I did in the past, but like the conversations were not going deeper and deeper. So I experienced a lot of, yeah, fetish, fetishism and just being like this exotic person that enhances like my dating history, but it's just a tick on the box. So that's, yeah, that's the experience that I had. And so when Brian actually, you know, I made sure, okay, you are actually a serious person and interested in the person that I am. He was also the first supporter of my book with the fundraiser <laughs> I remember the very first so when he came to Italy he it was actually during the pandemic because of the borders for almost a year and a half I wasn't able to see my parents and my family both in Brazil and Italy so he made sure that whenever the borders would open like we would catch the first flight and just go and uh, whether it was going to be Brazil or Italy. And so we decided Italy. And the encounter with my parents, it was actually lovely. There was nothing I had imagined. Oh my gosh, this is my first boyfriend and my dad will see him. I don't know, Italian dads, how they are, how they react. Also, he's a black man. I don't know. I mean, he's married to a black woman or even my mom. Oh, He's a black American. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? There's a language barrier or something. But actually it was pretty lovely. It went very chill and they liked him. He liked them. The biggest challenge was mostly like for him and also for me seeing how he reacted to these things. Being black in Italy and uh, having certain kinds of interactions whenever we were not at home. It was not shocking the fact to meet my family or even like engaging with the conversations with my friends, my close friends, but it was mostly like whenever we would travel to other places in Italy or going to the grocery store or going to people looking at you for 
the way that you wear your hair, the way that you talk. And also he noticed that him being American, like he could get away with being American, but if he was black from another country, he could see like the difference. Like he literally said, oh, so if I'm black, but I'm from another country, I'm treated this way. But if I'm black American, I'm cool, quote unquote. And I was like, yes, that's the horrible factor that is happening here. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And if you are, be sure to support this podcast by going to buymeacoffee.com slash flourish foreign and buying me a coffee. You can also write a review of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, and anywhere else you listen to the show. Thank you so much for listening and supporting. Now, back to the episode. I asked Julia her thoughts on Black Girl Soft Life. I am smiling in this moment because TikTok trends are just... I take them so lightly, to be honest, because... TikTok is a great platform. Don't get me wrong. It can be a great platform, but I feel so bad for the younger generations that take like everything that they see that must be true. That's like the Bible. That is the a sacred text and not at all. <laughs> I think that soft girl or whatever this name is and its variations It is a thing, yes, but it shouldn't be a trend even. (laughs) And being soft doesn't mean that you're not gonna encounter problems or obstacles. Because if I must be honest, I am living my own version of soft life now that I am here. But nobody knows the mental breakdowns that I have every day, the nights that I cry, But even in a healthy relationship with best friends, literally in in all the countries that I am affiliated with, so in Brazil, in Italy, and in the United States, like no matter the support system, there are some obstacles that I still have mentally because of the system and the society that I cannot control. And those things come at me, those things, those dynamics come at me because of the person that I am, regardless of what I seem to have. Sometimes as black women, we tend to highlight like what we don't have. And we are like trying to place ourselves in and market sometimes even ourselves. Because we are black, we don't have this and that. But I'm trying to do the opposite and say, because I am black, I have this and this is my privilege. Because nobody else can take that from me. So... Like this uh, idea of being a black girl and engaging in soft life. What really like being soft uh, doesn't mean that your life must be perfect 24-7. Because if it's perfect 24-7, there's actually an issue. (laughs) It means that you don't have a purpose in your work and your mission. So when it comes to even like girls, black women abroad... What does it mean like your existence abroad? Is there a reason why you went abroad? What are you trying either for yourself or for your other dynamics? What are you trying to disrupt? Because even the act of being abroad, it is, yes, a privilege, but also an action of disruption that you're doing because nobody asked you, oh, you have to go or you have to leave. Nobody told you that. You could have endured your life already in the country you were born into. But sometimes you had to escape a situation because there was like something that pushed you to do that. Okay, that doesn't come from soft life 24-7. You did that because there was something that was not working or that maybe you wanted to find a way to work better and you found that solution for yourself. But that was just a channel That was not the place of perfection. So 
I always smile whenever people tell me why you're not in Italy drinking wine and like having an Italian boyfriend or just lay down on the beaches in Brazil and not care anything, drinking a caipirinha and dancing samba. Yeah, that's part of the culture. And by the way, I'm not intrigued by Italian men. There is also this whole stereotype about Italian men, I'm especially coming from black girls. I'm like, y'all need to stop watching too much Netflix. So <laughs> I'm not saying that a black American man or American men in general are perfect, because no, but that's another discussion. <laughs> but people have this idea that if you are from abroad, oh, why you're not in your country? Because you have all this list of beautiful things. Why you're not there and why you're here necessarily? Soft life, it doesn't mean that everything is slow because also for me for example the lifestyle in europe it's good it could be a good one but i like actually the lifestyle that i'm building here and the fast paced and like trying to be independent that is something that i cannot do necessarily in italy but i could have the soft life drinking wine and going on a vespa <laughs> all 24 7. i could do that but will that satisfy me or will that fulfill the purpose that i'm doing i will be so much immersed in this soft life that i will lose all the aspirations that i really have so there must be a balance but at the same time yeah being a black woman and uh, engaging in this soft life, it really, that's a conversation that really must be taken with a grain of salt because you can build your own wealthy place wherever you are. And if you are abroad, that doesn't mean that you will solve all your problems. Not at all. Not at all. And that's something that I had to work on that too, because Six years ago, I thought that coming to the United States would solve all my problems. I will see people who look like me doing great things. I will be independent. I will do this. I will do that. Yes, there are the realities that I had envisioned in, in Italy, here. Yes, those are realities, but you have to work for that. And you have to maintain that. If you want to be sustainable... You can't have this soft life 24-7. So for me, if you want to be a soft black girl or, again, whatever this trend is, you have to be aware of who you are, your privileges, as well as your struggles, both at the same time, and, like, fulfill your purpose. Whatever that is, fulfill your purpose. I asked Julia to discuss her career as a fashion journalist. My career is at the beginning... I define myself a culture writer and a fashion journalist because that's what I do and I've been doing. I have been published in both languages, in Italian and English, on Vogue, on the Garnet Report, on other magazines as well. I work in media and fashion journalism, so I have also had experiences in fashion as a talent and I can definitely see the terrible... <laughs> colorist experiences that had happened to me but also that I have seen where I could have benefited from if I hadn't spoken up or I could have gotten away with but yeah that's those are the kinds of privileges and slash obstacles that because I'm here in the United States and because I studied abroad I am more and more aware and also I must consider myself I am a light-skinned woman so I am aware that of the privileges that I hold, especially in media, because of the experience that I have been observing as a journalist and as a researcher. I've been encountering more and more both academic text, but also editorial projects that combined with each other. They gave me much more of a wider vision on the state of black beauty. And when I say beauty, I don't mean exactly the industry, but beauty as a concept of black bodies, black uh, spirits, individuals. And so how beautiful can it be to be black and to be portrayed in creative spaces? Because of this, I also started Fashion on the Beat. I was realizing that I 
have been observing the fashion and the industry, both as a business, both as a creative, and also as a editorial space. Because yes, you said that fashion sells, but it's all, it also portrays. And the products are not necessarily just clothes, but it's also articles around culture and the way that you dress. There are also all kinds of products that you can think of, it's not just clothes, stories as well. I have been noticing that when it comes to black people, stories, culture, in fashion, there is a tendency on just highlighting just the beautiful aspects and uh, the, the end game and just how a person got to where they got, it's always overlooked. And being black also means that we, no matter where you were born, it means that you have endured some kind of, some kind of difficulty in earning your space wherever you are, entry level, on a C-suit level, anything. So you have endured some, some pain some kind of pain, and you had to demonstrate that you are just as valuable and just worthy as 10,000 other people that do not look like you. And then, of course, this kind of uh, obstacles are even more difficult if you layer up with other categories. So if you are a member of the LGBTQ plus community, if you are an immigrant, if English is not your first language, if you suffer and uh, you are a victim of ableism. So that's definitely a, something to think about. So black fashion and black people in fashion, in America, there is a tendency on just like being glamorous and uh, just perpetuated the same cycles and uh, taking a lot of inspiration just from other spaces that are white and they don't add anything really to the conversation and they really just are mirroring what they want to see of a black version of something. But I think that we need to be freed from this concept that we have to be mirror of something when can we literally be our own selves so when it comes to black media and black publications there is a lot of talent and there are a lot of stories that are not as valued important or placed on a certain level and put on a pedestal just because they're so unusual they are not glamorous enough so I think that is a problem. And what I'm saying, it may be a little bit controversial, but I think that's a problem that black people in America sometimes are not interested in knowing and observing other black realities also. So what it means to be black and immigrant in the United States, what it means to be black, but being black in another white country what it means to be black in uh, already in a diverse country or even in West Africa, in East Africa. Like those are two completely different regions, but both of them have the potential to produce stories that can literally inspire people. And I think that's, that this is a problem that I've been seeing and not enough diversity within diversity and the value of diversity in the US, but that's also the thing that pushes me even to do more in controversial ways. We are a magazine, we are nothing big at the moment, but I'd rather, I'd rather be like a little turtle, like just going slow, absorbing and understanding and being humble in my actions, rather than just be focused on the glamour. Right now, I am in school, but not at Hofstra. I am at CUNY, Lehman College, and I am studying Africana and African American Studies under the Liberal Arts program. So I decided to, last year, to enroll in this program where my mentors are both Italian and Brazilian, and I have an entourage of black women, brown women, on an academic level, but also as, a, as an entrepreneur. 
I'm supposed to graduate May 2023. And I chose African and African American studies because the experience that the best and the most vibrant experience that I had here in the United States, they were literally because of the minorities and the immigrants that make this country. And so I wanted to understand more on an academic level the history and the the structures of black and brown people and the African diaspora, so people like me. And so I decided, okay, let's apply the pressure and hit some books. So when it comes to my career, I experienced until now, honestly, more downs than ups. And that's because, again, of that layer that I have encountered as an immigrant, as an expat in the United States. For those who don't know, when you are an international student in the United States, after you have completed your academic journey, whatever the cycle and the level of your education is, so it can be a BA, an associate degree, a master's, PhD, after that you are allowed to extend your visa and do this year that it's called OPT year, which basically is through the extension of the visa, F1 visa. That's the name of when international students want to do a visa, that's the name F1. So after that, you are allowed to work in the field of your studies, doing, you know, anything. You can be in any kind of role that you want, but it has to be in the field of your studies. And you are allowed to do that with this OPT program one year. So it's called usually OPT year. And there is also another kind of visa, very similar. It's the CPT, if I'm not mistaken. And that is possible. It works in the same way. And it's possible when you extend that visa during your academic year and you work while you are in school and then all the amount of time that you didn't get to do while you were in school, you can do that throughout the year, the remaining year, and you can fulfill all those hours and days. Because the biggest trick, I would say, is that when you are an international student in the United States, compared to other countries in the United States, you cannot work when you are an international student. And that was a big problem for me and still is to be honest right now I work on campus and uh, yeah I work on campus and uh, during my OPT year so between 2020 and 2021 I have uh, enrolled in this OPT program and I extended my visa and it was the worst year to do that because it was just the first hit of wave of the pandemic and being a journalist during that first very first phase of the recession was not a good thing because I experienced layoffs, unpaid internships. uh, It was tough and it took a toll on my mental health uh, a lot. At the time, I had published my first book, uh, Fashion on the Beat, The Melodies and Rhythms in Fashion Journalism. And uh, it was a hybrid project. Uh, It was, yes, self-published, but I was backed up by this uh, publishing house, the New Degree Press from Georgetown University. And so because of that, I kept going and it, uh, it helped me, this project of mine, that I was able to do that between, again, my senior year and my OPT year. I asked her to discuss her book and why she felt compelled to write it. First of all, read my book if you get the chance. Fashion on the Beat, The Melodies and Rhythms in Fashion Journalism. That is a diary of a black Italian woman finding herself and her identity. So also what it means to be black in general. In, of course, in a context that is not familiar to a lot of people. But the context of my journey is that I found myself and like I found who I can be. And my journey here in New York City in the United States, uh, so that's already a whole reality, so different from 10,000 others. And uh, in a period of time also that a lot of people don't think, but I was in college 
from 2016 to 2020. Politically, the United States was charged <laughs> with a lot of energies and a lot of dynamics that made this country even tougher than it used to be and uh, just uh, a place where the so-called American dream was even more and more faint. At the end of my OPT, I decided to enlarge and elevate the book that I had just published. I wanted to elevate it into a communal project into a mentorship program and a space where other journalists, other people that were going through my same thing could find a safe uh, digital space because a lot, a lot <laughs> of publications were not accepting me or they were accepting me and then because of my visa situation, they would let me down or I was not eligible enough, no matter the degrees, no matter the anything. And I felt embarrassed and I felt that, okay, there's nothing I can do. I keep having all these opportunities in front of me, but I can never accept it. Or if I accept it, I know that at a certain point I will be refused to go forward. So I didn't lose faith and I turned all these negative experiences into something that, okay, if this is something that I'm experiencing in a negative way, I'm going to do this at opposite. So I took all my savings that I had because of this OPT year that I had accumulated. And with the help of um, the proceeds of the book and a little bit of my parents and family in Brazil, we started a business and I founded Fashion on the Beat. And Fashion on the Beat is the digital magazine that I founded in 2021. And it's an extension of the book. My book is a, a diary, I would say a college diary, but it's a diary and the result of my blog that I had in school at Hofstra. And uh, it's a diary of a black Italian woman in the United States where she finds herself through adventures and endeavors in fashion and uh, journalism. So because of these two passions, she finds herself. And uh, those were my sentiments back in 2020 and still are. But because of the difficulties that I had and endured in 2021, I decided, okay, so let's make something good out of it. I don't believe in being negative. Uh, for that, I'm very Brazilian. There's always a smile in my face. And I am just like my mom. My mom, if you picture her, she is the sun, literally. is a very solid person. And the one thing that she always tells me is to always smile, no matter what, as long as you have breath in your body, you are capable to do something and there's no need to despair. And I did that. And one year later, we are here with hundreds of people following us, reading us. I asked Julia, what is her personal definition of wellness? And how has that definition of wellness evolved as she has lived abroad? Wellness to me is taking care of your basic and personal needs, that's already a blessing that a lot of people take that for granted. So that's why I'm always big on as long as you have life within your body, you can see the light and you have a roof on the up of your, your head that you are able to talk to a few people that those are little things, but they are so major. And that for me is wellness. So being also able and aware to count what you have rather than what you don't have. And trust me, like I am the first one to have those days that I see all negative and I see, oh, I don't have that. So I will never get uh, X, Y and Z. I must, I might as well stop everything and just go back to my house or go wherever. I don't know. But I worked so hard to get where I am. And like, why would I need to go backwards? There's only forward. So it just takes me like a few hours to go back to that energy. But it's okay to allow those even negative flows in your head and let them circulate because they will never go away like negative thoughts as even like 
the trend soft girl life. There is this idea that if you embrace that kind of lifestyle, all like your problems will go away. Whether that is instantly or on a long-term journey, like there is the certainty that all your problems will go away, which is not a certainty at all. Like you have to be aware and that's where wellness is for me, is like self-awareness on when you are able to let the negative come to you, digest it and let it go. It's the let go part that I think people are not aware of it or like they don't want to embrace that. But it takes a lot of work. Like I'm still working on that. I'm saying this like I sound like a guru or something, but I'm still working on that as well. But that's something that, you know, being sustainable with yourself. Like how can I sustain my goals, my purpose with everything that I have? Do not think about what you don't have. Think about what you have. That for me is wellness and that touches all kinds of aspects in your life. So your romantic life, your platonic life and relationships, your familiar ties, your identity, your womanhood, your financial stability. When it comes to money as well, like I am aware that, yes, I can be financially independent, but there's always going to be some kind of step that I can always improve, but I don't have to be a millionaire to be happy. Money helps. Yes, it does. I'm not saying that it doesn't. It does. But if you enjoy where you are, you're definitely going to enjoy more where you are headed to. Wellness is for me being aware of who you are, what you have, and let go of, embrace and let go the negative that affects you. Thank you so much, Julia, for sharing your incredible story. If you're interested in keeping up with Julia, you can via social media. So you can find my personal stuff journey as a as a journalist, as a fashion enthusiast at the curly flower at the curly, just like the curls, but as an adjective curly flower. And there is a reason why my name is like that, because my motto is the curly, I'm the curly flower, my petals are my curls, my curls are my petals, hence the curly flower. And I'm from Florence, the city of flowers, and I'm curly because that's my black heritage and voluptuous hair, so that's me. And I blossom, I keep blossoming. (laughs) And you can find also all the work that my team and I are doing it's a black owned business uh, and collective and it's the fashion magazine that we founded in 2020 2021 yeah launched so it's called fashion on the beat and it's at fashion on the beat on instagram you can find everything right now at the curlyflower.com Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And for more information about our guest, be sure to check out this episode's show notes on the website, flourishtotheforeign.com. That's where you'll see pictures, a full bio, and ways that you can connect with this guest. If you enjoy Flourish in the Foreign and you are interested in possibly becoming a digital nomad, then I have the podcast for you. The Maverick Show, hosted by Matt Bowles, who is an amazing, amazing real estate investor, podcaster, and overall just really great person, to be honest. Matt has been in the podcasting game, digital nomad space, location dependent space way before it was buzzworthy, trendy or anything like that. So if you're interested in hearing more stories from long term digital nomads who globetrot on their own terms or learning about how real estate investment can fund your life abroad, Go check out the Maverick Show podcast. Learn more about Matt and his real estate services at themaverickshow.com. Remember, it's not about moving abroad. It's not about being abroad. 
It's about flourishing abroad. So go abroad and cultivate a life well lived. See you next time. On the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And so here I feel like I can be my full self as a black person, as a black woman and not get criticized for, oh, black folks don't do that. Oh, oh, you sound like a white girl. Or, you know, like I don't have to face those things. I can do what I want and it's just accepted by people that this is who I am. And I'm very thankful for that because I've always struggled to be like, oh, maybe I'll keep this to myself. You know, maybe I won't be so loud about it. 